Um, <laughs> this is the second time I've I've done this. Um, I, I recorded this lecture earlier, but um, uh, I had a new platform on my on my Apple computer, and uh, I didn't turn on all the the buttons that I needed to, so I didn't get the uh, the sound. But now we've got sound, so we should be okay. I hope we are, anyway. This is chapter three. It's about, uh, finally, in uh, drug use and abuse, we're going to talk about a specific type of drug. Uh, we're going to talk about uppers today, stimulants, uh, and it is chapter three. Uh, 2008, uh, 5.6 million Americans used cocaine or cocaine products. Uh, 1.4 million Americans used methamphetamines for non-medicinal purposes. 83 million Americans used a tobacco product in 2008. 166 million Americans drank coffee last year. Most of them drank it daily. My son does. He can't live without his coffee. Uh, he has special roast and whatnot. Americans averaged 56 gallons of soft drinks per person in 2008. Most of them were caffeinated. Uh, that is uh, 598 uh, 12-ounce cans or 359 20-ounce bottles of pop, uh, one kind or another. These are all, those are Coke products. In 2008, 200 million people used betel nut. They brew it and drink it like coffee, or they chew it. And when they chew it, it turns their teeth an attractive color of black or red. It's actually red, and then... The darker it gets, the, the blacker their teeth look. Uh, we ran into people in Vietnam who were, women would chew this stuff as they were working. And they find it attractive, of course. Southeast Asia, especially Thailand, the area is having a severe problem with a form of methamphetamine called Yaba. In the area around the, the Horn of Africa, the majority of male population and much of the female population chew cot a mild stimulant, and that's what cot looks like. Uh, 1.3 billion people worldwide smoke cigarettes. Uh, natural stimulants, uh, cocaine is comes from the coca shrub, uh, nicotine comes from the tobacco plant, cathinone comes from the cot bush, uh, ephedrine comes from the ephedra bush, uh, aracoline comes from the betel nut, and caffeine comes from the coffee plant. There you go. Synthesized uh, stimulants, methamphetamines, of course, diet pills of one kind or another, uh, amphetamines. Uh, methylphenidate is, is another name for it is Ritalin that we give to our children that are suffering from ADHD. And methcathinone is a synthesized stimulant. Stimulants increase the activity in the central nervous system. They boost your energy. They raise your heart rate and blood pressure. They increase your respiration. They reduce appetite and they subdue your thirst. They may uh, make the user more alert, more active, more confident, more anxious, more restless, uh, and more aggressive, unfortunately. Stimulants are used to treat narcolepsy, obesity, and ADHD. Um, we're gonna talk about performance-enhancing per performance drugs. Uh, it's really kind of interesting. Baseball got really upset about performance-enhancing drugs, which makes sense. Uh, steroids and and other substances that uh, built mass muscles, uh, but before the uh, the peds, the before the performance enhancing drugs, uh, there were stimulants all over all over baseball. As a matter of fact, um, the uh, people used to uh, chew tobacco chew tobacco uh, on the field uh, and spit, of course, a lot. But uh, they also took amphetamines. Uh, this was a uh, this is something that happened in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so the reality is that people have always used performance enhancing drugs in baseball from uh, alcohol and uh, tobacco uh, in the early years to uh, amphetamines and then to steroids and anything else, human growth hormone and whatnot. Stimulants are used to treat narcolepsy, obesity, and ADHD. Uh, stimulants work by affecting four neurotransmitters, epinephrine, which increases your energy, norepinephrine, which increases confidence, feelings of well-being, and motivation, 
serotonin, which increases your energy, and dopamine, which also increases your energy. Uh, most of the neurons affected by epinephrine and norepinephrine are located in an area of the midbrain called the locus ceruleus. This portion of the brain networks with many parts of the rest of the brain, and that's why you get such a strong stimulation. When the body needs an extra jolt of energy, epinephrine and norepinephrine are released to provide the energy. When the individual takes uppers, it forces the release of the energy chemicals. These drugs cause the body to react to stress that doesn't exist and makes the individual talkative, hyperactive, and hypervigilant, kind of like Barney Fife uh, when he was uh, Andy Griffith's deputy on uh, Mayberry or the Andy Griffith show or whatever that show is called. Uh, the stronger the stimulant, the longer it takes the body to recover. Uh, large quantities uh, over long periods of time deplete the body's energy stores and leaves the body without reserves. Withdrawal from stimulants can create severe depression that can last for days, weeks, or even months. People tend to build a fairly rapid tolerance to, stimulant, uh, forcing, to the stimulant, forcing the individual to consume more and more of the substance. Even coffee will require more and more with increased, increased consumption. Uh, the reward reinforcement pathway is a natural structure that informs the individual of an activity or substance that support, supports survival. Hunger is satiated, thirst is satiated, sexual desire is satiated. When a strong stimulant is used, it overstimulates the reward reinforcement pathway, and the body doesn't respond to hunger, thirst, or sexual activity. The brain cannot be satisfied. As more and more of the stimulant is used, tolerance builds and the rush in stimulation diminishes. But what does remain is the emotional memory of the effects of the stimulant. This is accomplished by the dopamine stimulation and the reward reinforcement pathway. One of the side effects of long-term stimulant usage can be dehydration and malnourishment. The hypothalamus uh, regulates thirst and hunger. Stimulants fool this part of the brain to think that the individual is neither hungry or thirsty. This can lead to deficiencies of vitamins and minerals as well as damage to the teeth. Uh, this is an individual that started, uh, they first arrested her uh, using crystal meth in 1995. Here she is in 1997. She's looking a little bit older. Uh, there she is later on, it five months later in 1997. You can see how her, her face has changed. Uh, her her uh, skin is becoming a little bit more sallow. Here she is in 1998. Here she is in 2000. And as you can see, the difference between these two women is uh, looks like she's aged 10 years and five years. Here she is in 2001. Looks like she's aged 20 years in five years. In six years, I'm sorry. Here she is in 2001. Uh, she could be a woman of 60 in this picture. Uh, and here she is in 2002. And as you can see, um, the difference between the tightness of her skin, um, the um, uh, shape, the what's happening with her eyes. Her eyes seem to be getting uh, to be collecting fluid trying to protect itself. This is Sean Wise. Uh, this is what he looked like uh, when he uh, was a, uh, an actor uh, in uh, uh, The Mighty Ducks. Uh, he was the goalie, if you remember him. He was, he was uh, comic relief. Uh, everyone, everyone enjoyed Goldberg. He was, he was a cute kid. Uh, he used uh, crystal meth for 30, uh, 20 years. I'm sorry, here he is, here he is on the street uh, two years ago. Uh, he's been clean and sober for two years, and this is what he looks like now. He looks more like he did when he was a kid. His face has uh, uh, gained a little volume, um, and, and he doesn't look as nearly as drawn, uh, even though he's got the same beard, I guess. Looks like it's not as white as it was. Well, there it is. There's the white stuff. Anyway, that's him now, uh, and this just came out two days ago um, on Instagram. He came out and said, uh, I've been clean and sober for two years, and he showed these two pictures. And this is the kid right here. This is him when he was a kid, I guess. He's 43 years old now, and uh, he's getting his life back together. Uh, we don't know what his teeth look like. Um, 
should be interesting. Stimulants including the weaker ones like nicotine and caffeine, caffeine induce vascular spasms and constrict blood flow to organs and tissue. Heavy smokers will have a pasty complexion due to the restricted blood flow. Uh, this restricted blood flow will slow tissue repair and the healing process. Chronic use of stimulants will weaken blood vessels, increasing the risk of stroke. Uh, so anytime you smoke, uh, actually you're slowing down your, your healing process. Uh, so if you get a, a, an injury, if you get a wound, it'll take you a lot, uh, as much as twice as long uh, to heal as you would if you left it alone or if you didn't smoke. But at least the stimulant user has increased confidence and stimulated uh, feelings of euphoria. Unfortunately, sometimes it goes beyond euphoria to paranoia. Um, they become talkative, restless, irritable. Uh, they uh, suffer from insomnia. Uh, they uh, become paranoid, aggressive, and sometimes violent. Prolonged use of high doses of methamphetamine can lead to a clinical level of paranoia or kick the individual into psychosis. Meth increases the dopamine in the central nervous system. One of the conditions of schizophrenia is an overabundance of dopamine receptor sites. Sometimes the meth user will drift into permanent schizophrenia. Uh, so they will be, they have made themselves schiz schizophrenic. Uh, I had a, uh, a student uh, when I was up on uh, working on Fort Belknap, um, who was who was a crystal meth user, and she she thought she was so smart that she could control it instead of it controlling her. Um, she used until she got arrested for um, kiting checks, not kiting checks, but uh, uh, forging checks. Uh, she got she was uh, put in prison for for a year and a half. And she came out clean, and she started to go to school again. Uh, and she said, she's, she, and even at that point, even after 18 months without any, any meth, uh, she still felt a little bit uh, fuzzy. Uh, she still had meth head. Um, but she did fairly well. She's a very intelligent individual. She was doing great. Uh, her problem was that uh, when she went to Great Falls, uh, which is a city in, in Montana from the reservation. She went to Great Falls. Uh, that's where she used, and uh, she couldn't go there because uh, every time she went, uh, she felt like she needed to use. Uh, so she had, had to shop. She had to shop in small towns. She couldn't go to, to, to uh, Great Falls to shop. Uh, but her father was in a farming accident, and she had to go down. She, of course, you know, that's the way... Uh, American Indians on the Northern Plains deal with uh, with uh, uh, problems like that. They have to go down and stay with the uh, person that's injured. So when she had to go down to Great Falls, and while she was there, she uh, her father died, um, and she fell off the wagon. And so she used, uh, but the problem was that uh, she uh, when she was high on meth. All of a sudden, she didn't couldn't remember who she was, and she developed this second personality. Her second person, she was uh, she was Aleut and uh, and Grovon, uh, but uh, her person her her alter ego was a Hispanic woman, and her she went in to see the police, and she said, "Oh my my father has murdered my mother." And he buried her in the backyard. This was three years ago. He buried her in the backyard. And they believed her. And she was speaking Spanish. Or not really speaking Spanish. But, but she was uh, uh, speaking a language that she thought sounded like Spanish. She didn't really speak the, the language. Uh, so they went to this house. And they dug up the backyard. Uh, it wasn't her. It wasn't her, her house. It wasn't her, her father's house. Uh, it was some stranger's house. <laughs> And they dug up the backyard. Of course, they didn't find anything because her mother was still alive. It was her father who had died, uh, and she claimed that uh, that he he had murdered his her mother, even though her mother was still alive. Anyway, eventually she came out of it. She stopped being psychotic, uh, and she had to pay a fine, of course, because she it was uh, she filed a false false 
from the port. She also had to pay for them digging up that, that person's backyard. It was a derelict house, by the way, but uh, uh, she still had to pay for it. So when she came back, I told her, you know, look, you, uh, if, <laughs> you've already had one psychotic episode. Uh, potentially, if you do this again, you may, you may become permanently uh, psychotic and not come back. And uh, I hope she took that to the bank. Uh, I haven't, uh, haven't talked to her in about 12 years, but uh, I'm hoping she stayed off the stuff. Uh, nicotine provides uh, almost immediate tolerance. All stimulants in a slower but similar manner develop tolerance rapidly. Dependence is developed with tolerance since the uh, need becomes greater and greater. Nicotine has the strongest dependence level. Cocaine is synthesized uh, from the coca leaf. Since its introduction in South America with the invasion of the Incas in Peru, it has enjoyed epidemics and lag periods. The first epidemic was at the end of the 19th century. The famous author Robert Louis Stevenson uh, wrote the novel Dr. Jekyll, uh, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in six days while taking cocaine as a treatment for tuberculosis. Many have speculated that the two personalities represented in the novel actually represented Stevenson on and off the stimulant. Stevenson may have written the novel to explain to friends his change of personality. Uh, eventually he died of tuberculosis, uh, but he certainly looks m far more drawn here. This is him later in life. This is him early in life. Uh, yeah. Cocaine uh, won't grow just anywhere like marijuana does. Uh, marijuana grows in the ditches around ev anywhere. Uh, I've got ditch weed in my, in my fence row. Cocaine grows in the moderately high slopes of the Andes Mountains. Uh, grows in Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Colombia. It also uh, grows on some of the islands of Java. Uh, some of, uh, it grows on Java in Indonesia. Uh, so it grows in the Andes, but it doesn't grow anywhere else. You couldn't grow it uh, in, in uh, the Rocky Mountains, for example. Uh, different, well, then... The ecology is different. Rocky Mountains are too far inland. Uh, the Andes are right on the uh, coast of South America. Coca leaves uh, don't con contain very much alkaloid cocaine. One acre of six to eight foot bushes will only produce uh, between 1.5 and 2 kilograms of uh, cocaine. That's uh, between three and four and a half pounds. Cocaine refinement begins with stage one, soaking the uh, leaves in alkali and water. Uh, stage two of cocaine refinement is where the workers add gasoline, acetone, or kerosene to create a paste. Uh, this is an accelerant. Gasoline, of course, is flammable. Acetone is, is highly flammable, and, and kerosene certainly is as well. You can imagine what the smell is coming off of this, these rotting plants soaked in gasoline, acetone, or, 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 or uh, kerosene. Stage three involves discarding the waste leaves and adding an acid, hydrochloric or sulfuric acid. In stage four, the cocaine paste is mixed with lime and ammonia. The last stage is separating the cocaine hydrochloride from the paste. And this is what it looks like. Actually, this isn't what it looks like. That's really flour, I think. <laughs> That's what it's supposed to look like. Smuggling cocaine into the United States has been a constant cat and mouse game between smugglers and the DEA since the 1970s. During the Reagan administration, a friend of the president's was killed by smugglers to steal his yacht. And since then, the military has been used, uh, has been used st to stop mass shipments coming in by plane and ship from South America. Um, I had students, uh, I was working at uh, Tinker Air Force Base, and some of the Hispanic students were drafted, uh, were asked to volunteer uh, to work in uh, drug interdiction. Uh, I had a, one of my, uh, my sergeants um, who was Hispanic, he was actually from uh, uh, East L.A., but he married a woman from uh, Bogota, Colombia. That's not right. He married a w woman from Bolivia, 
who spoke in a with a a South American patois. And he learned her language, and uh, he was uh, instrumental in um, understanding what the the uh, the uh, drug smugglers were saying, because most of them were Colombian, rural uh, Colombians, and they spoke in they didn't really speak in Spanish. Well, they did speak in Spanish, but they spoke with a with a, a patois. They used uh, words differently and whatnot. And it was very similar to to, uh, to her, uh, what she, the language that she spoke. He spoke uh, uh, Mexican uh, Spanish, and she spoke uh, Bolivian Spanish. Anyway, he was instrumental in, in catching a lot of these people. This is a submarine that they uh, that they built to smuggle cocaine into the United States. As weird as that is. Uh, yeah, he's, he was in on a lot of raids. I, I was just looking at a postcard he sent me from South America telling me what he was doing. Uh, today there is only uh, one sure route in the United States, and that is along the poorest uh, border with Mexico. Uh, Colombian drug cartels smuggle about two-thirds of their product in this manner. Uh, the last third uh, continues to come, in, uh, to come over by sea. Uh, North America consumes 40 to 50% of the world's cocaine. I just read a book about uh, the killing of Pablo Escobar, uh, the hunting down of Pablo Escobar. Uh, my goodness gracious, lots of people uh, were being killed. Uh, they were retaliating. Anytime they lost a shipment, they would retaliate by killing a government official in Colombia. Uh, they were trying to control the government. And they were fairly successful for whew, for about uh, 10 years. Uh, and then finally, of course, they cornered Pablo and uh, were able to, uh, to kill him. Uh, it didn't stop things, of course, because he was just one leader. There were other cartels. There were other leaders that filled his void. Um, it is estimated that Americans spent uh, $36.1 billion on cocaine in 2004. By 2019, the figure had risen to $150 billion a year. Cocaine in the United States averages 84% purity, with prices ranging from $12,000 to $35,000 per kilogram. And a kilogram, this is a brick, a kilogram is about 2.2 pounds, and that is worth between $12,000 and $3,500. Uh, there are a 1,000 grams in a kilogram, of course. Uh, the street value of one gram of cocaine is between $50 and $200, with an average purity of 57%. Crack cocaine comes in rocks from uh, one-tenth of a, a gram to one-half a gram, and they sell for $10 to $20 each rock. Hardcore cocaine users will spend an average of $186 per week on cocaine. Cocaine is actually cheaper than it ever has been before. It is estimated that there are probably over 3 million hardcore cocaine users in the United States. The man at the left is pitchman Billy Mays, who OD'd on cocaine at age 51. Uh, he used to sell OxyClean. And uh, he, he was loud and he was, he was very boisterous, but part of that may have been the cocaine that he was using. And these are all the products that he, that he advertised on television. Uh, when the Spanish first arrived in South America, they found many people in the Andes Mountains chewing coca leaves. Uh, most Incan uh, users actually mixed the juice with lime from ground shell. Uh, or ash to accelerate the introduction of the alkaloid into the brain. The introduction occurs in about three to five minutes. Uh, these are actually Incan uh, uh, bear, bearers. Uh, they're carrying things, as you can see. This is the Inca Trail. The Inca Trail is a, a trail that runs for hundreds of miles in uh, the Andes Mountains. Uh, I was on the Inca Trail when I was down in, in Peru. Uh, it's still it's still a highway. It's still a foot footpath, of course. Uh, they don't want you to do anything else on it, but uh, yeah, you can walk it. And as you can see, it was it's been there for for five or six hundred years, maybe seven hundred years, parts of it a thousand years, and it's still 
intact because they stuck it together so well. The conquistadores encouraged use of coca uh, to increase the productivity of their Quichua workers. That's their native workers down there. They speak a language called Quichua. In 1859, Albert Newman isolated the active ingredient in coca leaves, cocaine hydrochloride. Uh, isolated, this substance was 200 times more powerful by weight than the coca leaf. Uh, the drug was uh, first used as an anesthetic and as a medicine to treat depression, uh, tuberculosis, and gastric disorder. If you go down to Peru today, you can still buy coca leaves. Um, you can buy coca tea. Uh, it's not, I understand it's not very strong. When we were down there, there were some people that, uh, that uh, uh, one guy <laughs> bought coca leaves as soon as we got off the plane. In Lima, he bought he bought a package of coca leaves, uh, and then he started chewing them. And of course, you know it's it's like chewing any <laughs> any leaf, uh, not not a very good taste. Uh, but you also have to put well, as they say, you have to put ash or lime, uh, and ground shell in it to uh, to get the the alkaloid to come out. He didn't do that. Uh, we had. They suggested that since we were so high up in the mountains, uh, we were up, uh, how high were we? Um, we were up about eight, 9,000 feet, I guess. Uh, they said, oh, you'll suffer from, uh, from uh, elevation sickness if you, don't, uh, if you don't use cocaine. I never used it, and uh, there was a, uh, I, I, I played softball, and there was another softball player on the, on the, uh, on the trip, and we, we thought that was kind of silly. So we didn't use it, and or everybody else drinking this tea and, and whatnot. Uh, but we didn't use it, and we didn't have any problem. Um, of course, uh, I'm for, I, I was, at the time, I was living in Lubbock, Lubbock, Texas. I was living in Harlem, Montana, and Harlem, Montana is at an elevation of 7,200 feet. So, uh, yeah. No, it wasn't. It's 4,200 feet. It's Saley that's at 7,200 feet. I'm sorry. Anyway, I was fine. I had no problem. I think Saley's probably at a higher elevation than, uh, than Cusco is. And that's right down by, um, uh, down by Machu Picchu. Um, but before that, we were in Lima, and we went from Lima to, to Cusco which is in the 7,000 foot range. Now, Machu Picchu is actually lower than Cusco. It's, it's at, uh, at about 5,000 feet, I think, about a mile high. Did I read all that? Yeah, I think so. Cocaine wine uh, was popular in France and Italy in the late 1860s. This ushered in the most modern cocaine epidemic as two glasses of wine delivered the same amount of cocaine as a line of Coke. Uh, it took 15 to 20, uh, 30 minutes for the cocaine to take effect after ingesting it in this manner. So there are wines. There you go. Awarded 10 gold medals, maltine with coca wine. Uh, by the 1880s, patented medicines and drinks began to appear laced with cocaine, opium, morphine, heroin, cannabis, and alcohol. Since no one really understood addiction or the real power of the supplements and their tonics, many people became addicted, especially women. They swore by their tonics. There you go. Cocaine, toothache drops, instantaneous cure. I'm sure it worked very, very well. <laughs> people began uh, introducing cocaine into their systems in new ways. Injecting intravenously introduces the drug into the system in 30 seconds. Snorting cocaine introduces the substance into the blood in two to five minutes. Snorting more cocaine is counterproductive as the drug is a vasoconstrictor. So once introduced into the nasal passage, it slows the absorption of any new cocaine. As the cocaine wears off, the nasal passage opens back up, causing a runny and, and sniffling nose. And this is fairly, uh, it, it also destroys uh, because, because it's a vasoconstrictor, it cuts off the blood, uh, blood supply to the nose. If you do this too much, uh, then those uh, blood vessels will rupture, 
uh, and they'll bleed, and they'll either bleed or they'll they'll close off. They'll just clot up. Uh, if that happens, then uh, the cartilage that they are supplying blood to will die, and that's happened many many times. People have had to have reconstructive surgery because they snorted so much cocaine that the uh, the septum in their nose uh, they uh, they may have developed a, a hole in their in their septum, which is no, referred to as a deviated septum, or it may have just broken down completely. Um, Linda Ronstadt had her nose uh, uh, reconstructed twice uh, because of her uh, cocaine uh, addiction. And now, of course, she has a form of Parkinson's disease. Uh, Michael J. Fox developed Parkinson's disease at a relatively young age, and it was probably had something to do with his uh, cocaine usage. Smoking uh, cocaine-laced cigarettes were introduced in 1914, but the high temperature of the cigarettes uh, destroyed most of the psychoactive substance. Because cocaine is a natural substance, it tends to be metabolized very quickly, and its effect uh, dissipates uh, much faster than synthetic stimulants. The half-life of cocaine is 30 to 90 minutes uh, and is detectable in the urine for up to 36 hours after ingestion. Your high only lasts for between 5 and 10 minutes. Cocaine is used as a topical anesthetic because of its powerful vasoconstriction capabilities. Since cocaine receptors are found in the smooth muscles of the lungs, cocaine use will cause the bronchi to dilate. Synthetic cocaine products mimic the effects of cocaine for eye, dental, and cutaneous surgeries. Uh, these are lidocaine, procaine, xylocaine, and the infamous Novocaine that they shoot into your, into your jaw to do dental work. Cocaine excites the user by blocking the reuptake of the neurotransmitters acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. The abundance of these neurotransmitters gives the individual a feeling of well-being, mastery, omnipotence, euphoria, and general excitement. Cocaine metabolizes fairly rapidly, leaving four, the four neurotransmitters vulnerable to reuptake when the cocaine is gone. Cocaine's positive effects disappear fairly suddenly after five or ten minutes. This absence of the previous feelings is referred to as the crash and may last four hour, for hours, days, or even weeks. Cocaine overstimulates the release of dopamine, if this occurs over time, it triggers the fright center in the brain, causing paranoia. Cocaine also overstimulates the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. If this occurs over time, the individual may suffer from lethargy, low blood pressure, and anhedonia, the inability to feel pleasure. Cocaine causes the overstimulation of serotonin, which not only makes the individual happy, but increases sexual activity as well. If this continues to happen over time, the individual may suffer from insomnia, agitation, and severe emotional depression. Cocaine blocks the metabolism of acetylcholine, increasing alertness, memory, and aggression. If overstimulation occurs over time, the person may suffer from tremors, memory lapses, mental confusion, and possibly hallucinations. Some people actually use cocaine as an aphrodisiac, since at low doses it enhances sexual desire and prolongs ejaculation. However, in some cases it causes spontaneous ejaculation. In higher doses and with chronic use, cocaine may cause erectile dysfunction and a disinterest in sex. The lack of sexual need may lead to high-risk sexual behavior and unusual sexual practices, since sexual need no longer exists for the individual. Uh, I'm going to tell you an ugly story. Um, my first wife left me and uh, ran off. <laughs> and when she lived uh, in her home, in our hometown, uh, she worked at a uh, truck stop uh, as a waitress. And on the side, she was pushing uh, speed uh, to the truckers. Uh, well, her supplier talked her into having sex with him one night, and of course he was on speed, and he gave her speed, uh, and according to her, they had sex all night long. 
uh, you know, it's a lovely story to tell uh, to to tell your the the person that you what happened was she got caught by the cops and they tried to get her to uh, to uh, turn in her supplier but she wouldn't do it uh, and instead she jumped on a bus and she came down I was living in Lubbock Texas at the time she was in Muncie Indiana. Uh, she jumped on a bus and, and ran down to Texas. And of course, this is one of the stories that she told me. Uh, and I was real happy to get, uh, to, for her to come back. Well, I had two small children, so, um, uh, I wasn't unhappy that, that she came back. But after her, her telling me all these of her sexual ex escapades, I wasn't nearly as happy as I was when she first when she first arrived. I know that's an ugly story and it's not very pleasant. But it's potentially true that, uh, that they had uh, sex for an extended period of time uh, because of the speed uh, that they were both, uh, they had both dropped. For cocaine users who are prone to violence, cocaine makes them more aggressive and violent because inhibitory functions are suppressed in the cingulate gyrus and the temporal lobes. Emotional triggers are overstimulated in the amygdala. The fright center is hyperactivated in the limbic system. When cocaine is combined with alcohol, the result is a substance called cocaethylene, which causes increased agitation, euphoria, and violence. In one study of domestic violence, all the perpetrators had used alcohol on the day of the violence, and 67% had used cocaine with the alcohol. Cocaethylene is also more likely to induce heart conduction anomalies that may lead to a heart attack. This substance has a half-life three times that of cocaine and therefore can cause prolonged high blood pressure. So it's kind of stupid to take cocaine and drink alcohol at the same time. <laughs> While the, the brain gains feelings of euphoria and well-being from cocaine, the heart is being abused by the substance. Cocaine causes the heart rate to increase and the blood vessels to constrict, raising blood pressure 20 to 30 units. Small muscle repair stops during use. The stress on the heart and the muscle damage uh, being done by its use can cause damage to the heart muscle, coronary arteries, and other blood vessels of the heart. Prolonged high blood pressure weakens blood vessel walls uh, in the brain, leading to stroke. Cocaine also causes a curious condition where calcium and fat deposits collect in blood vessels causing heart attacks or stroke. And this is one of the things that you need to think about when we're talking about people who use cocaine in the past. Here they are, they're dropping dead in their 50s and 60s. Potentially Sean Wise, who has was, on, was using uh, crystal meth for an extended period of time. He's not going to live uh, for as long as he would have lived if he had stayed off of, off of drugs. If we look at what he looked like, well, let's not go back. Well, go ahead. Let's go back and look at what he looked like. Where are you, Sean? Come on. There you are. Okay. Uh, this is what he looked like. Uh, one of the reasons he looks like this is because his body can't repair uh, any of the, the small muscle uh, problems that he has. This is what he looks like now, and he may live for another 10 or 20 years, but if he hadn't used cocaine, he, he's damaged his heart, he's damaged his brain. Uh, the uh, it uh, Cocaine uh, makes you, is almost like uh, uh, self-induced schizophrenia, and if you do this over a period of time, of course, it damages your brain, and that's potentially uh, what happened to uh, uh, Robin Williams was a cocaine user, uh, and, and he uh, committed suicide after he found out that he had Alzheimer's disease with Lewy bodies. Um, uh, Linda Ronstadt has a form of Parkinson's disease. Uh, um, Michael J. Fox, of course, has Parkinson's disease. So you never know what this is doing to you. And even though we talk about, oh, yeah, you get off the stuff, you're, you're fine. Uh, you're better, actually. But uh, uh, it may actually uh, reduce the length of time that you're going, that you would have lived had you uh, 
and just stayed off this drug, this stuff. Because of all these problems, uh, damages your heart, damages your brain, uh, it damages, it weakens your blood vessels, uh, it can lead to stroke or heart attack. Cocaine uh, crosses the placental barrier, meaning that when mom uses, her fetus uses also within seconds. Damage is done to the fetus's blood vessels of a similar reaction to that of the mother and may result in miscarriage, stroke, placental separation, or sudden infant death syndrome. One study looking at 717 babies born to cocaine using mothers found that they were born on an average 1.2 weeks early, 1.2 pounds lighter, one inch shorter, a head that is three quarters of an inch smaller in circumference. The babies are born agitated, irritable, with high blood pressure. The baby is usually malnourished because that is the lifestyle of the cocaine and amphetamine user. They're not hungry, so they don't eat. No matter what's going on in their abdomen, they don't care. Uh, they aren't hungry, so they won't eat. Escaping from cocaine-soaked placental environment does not remove the child from danger. Stimulant users are often inattentive and uncaring about the needs of others, and this includes their infants, which results in emotional deprivation of the, for the child, neglect of the child, and bonding problems. Studies show that rates of mental delays are double among stimulant-exposed children. All is not bleak, of course, with concentrated postnatal care. These infants catch up with their peers by toddlerhood, but concentrated postnatal care is not something that a mother who is a, uh, a cokehead is going to, to do, or a meth head, for that matter. Tolerance of the euphoric effect begins with the first usage of cocaine. Increased usage has been seen uh, of uh, 25 times the level within days. This is due to the adaptation of the brain to dopamine stimulation in the nucleus accumbens. Tolerances uh, to the euphoric effect only, since paranoia increases, as does cardiovascular effects. Withdrawal from cocaine use is very real, despite the misperceptions of researchers into the 1990s. Uh, for, a long, for the longest time, they said that cocaine wasn't addictive, uh, but the reality is it is. Um, the problem is that the withdrawals uh, happened so rapidly that, that uh, they were thinking that it that didn't exist. All the crash symptoms become accentu accentuated and prolonged depending on the do dosage used, frequency of use, and the length of use. Uh, they suffer from anhedonia, which we learned meant uh, they can't find any pleasure. Uh, they have a lack of energy, emotional depression, loss of motivation, anxiety, vivid and unpleasant dreams, insomnia, increased appetite, psychomotor agitation, intense craving for the drug. Uh, cycle of quitting and relapse of stimulants. Uh, after a binge session with the drug, the individual crashes, sleeps for a prolonged period, uh, awakens with renewed energy, and swears off the drug forever, uh, mainly because they feel so bad when they come down off the stuff. This is, this is due to the crash. They don't want to feel that way again. The individual feels better for a few days and begins uh, to feel as they did before they began using the drug. Seven to ten days after quitting, the craving starts to build, energy level uh, drops, emotional depression sets in as they can find no pleasure in their surroundings. Remember the anhedonia. After a, a couple of weeks or a month, they relapse, not being able to deal with the depression or the ever-increasing craving. While cocaine overdoses are common uh, because of the rapid metabolization, the effects are rarely fatal. In large city emergency rooms in 2004, 41% of the visits were due to cocaine usage, most uh, because of uh, the individual felt as if they were dying. The U.S. averages between two to 3,000 stimulant deaths every year, either from the initial stimulatory stage that causes seizures, hypertension, hyperthermia, stroke, or tachycardia. Tachycardia mean, tach means fast and cardia means heart. That means uh, rapid uh, heartbeat. Uh, or later with the depression stage from extreme respiratory depression and coma. Some people will experience inverse tolerance where they become more sensitive to cocaine's effects. Long-term cocaine or amphetamine usage uh, may lead to tactile hallucinations called formications. The sensations that tiny 
the sensation that tiny bugs are crawling on the user's skin. The user will sometimes scratch themselves bloody trying to rid themselves of the imaginary pests. And this is one of the ways that you can tell if somebody is a, uh, is a, a speed user, is a, a uh, cocaine or a methamphetamine user. Uh, they, they're itching. They're, they're, they're constantly messing with their, with their uh, uh, skin. Um, my son uh, was a chef, and he worked in kitchens in Los Angeles. He said they could they could tell the uh, meth and, and cocaine users because they would shave all the hair off their bodies. Uh, and the reason they do this is because of the formication, because of the itching. Uh, the more the more hair they have, uh, the more tactile stimulation they get. So what they do is they shave all the hair off their body. Uh, bald head, uh, no hair on their arms. They look like a swimmer who's, uh, who's going into the Olympics. Um, I had a, uh, let's see, how can I explain this? It was my niece's husband. Uh, the first time I met him, this guy had shaved arms and shaved legs, I thought, and, and a bald head. And of course, he was only in his uh, early 20 or late 20s, early 30s. And I knew right away what was going on. That and the fact that he was kind of jumpy yeah, you know, he's always trying to move. Uh, uh, I, I was playing, uh, he had a son, and I was playing catch with his son, uh, football. We were uh, throwing a football back and forth, and he came out, and he started playing. And um, uh, what he had to do was be, he had to get the ball every other time. So the his son and I went down to one end, and he went down to the other end, and, and he started throwing back and forth. All of a sudden, he th started throwing harder and harder and harder. Um, uh, and it was okay for me because, you know, I'm, I'm old. Uh, but his son was only 10 or 11 years old, and he started whipping the ball to, to his son. And by golly, of course, one went through his hands and hit him right in the mouth. But uh, I, knew, I knew he was, uh, he was using something. Uh, eventually, he overdosed. He, he overdosed. He had a heart attack. Uh, he was a meth user, and uh, when my father, di my mother died, he they inherited. Uh, his wife inherited twenty thousand dollars, and he took some of that and bought uh, uh, the good stuff. He bought uh, he bought cocaine, and he tried to use it the way he used the the methamphetamine in it, uh, and he died. It killed him because he wasn't used to uh, that type of uh, a drug. As sad as that is, and the next, uh, the, about two months later, uh, another one of my niece's husbands uh, drank himself to death. Uh, so it was really strange. It was a really strange uh, uh, winter. Uh, one, uh, well, it was a spring, I guess. It was in uh, June. It was in June. Anyway, he killed himself. He overdosed, uh, and I knew the first time I saw him. And it, he claimed he claimed that the reason he he shaved his hair was because he was trying to lose weight, uh, which made absolutely no sense whatsoever. But of course, with a meth head, uh, logic isn't their strong suit. Cocaine and amphetamine usage may also cause dental problems from the, for the user. This is usually caused from poor nutrition poor dental hygiene, and the acidic effects of the drug. The individual also tends to suffer dehydration, which causes the gums to recede. It's not a pretty picture. Seizures are sometimes caused by excessive cocaine or amphetamine usage. 2 to 10% of cocaine users will have seizures, three times more women than men because of their smaller, uh, their lighter weight and smaller body size, less fat. Cocaine and amphetamine users can sometimes suffer from gastrointestinal problems, gastric ulcers, uh, retroperitoneal uh, fibrosis, that is hardening of the, uh, of the intestines, visceral infarction where parts of their intestines die, intestinal ischemia, this is blood clots in their intestines, gastrointestinal tract perforation, holes in their intestines, and colonic ischemia. <clears throat> colon, <clears throat> your colon is your large intestine. <clears throat> Another possible side effect of cocaine usage comes from the dopamine changes in the cerebellum from cocaine or amphetamine toxicity. 
The individual suffers from involuntary writhing, flailing, jerking, or, or sinuous movements of the arms and legs. This is sometimes referred to as meth or crack dancing. And I'm going to show you a film of somebody who was crack dancing. This is from a television show, strangely what we enough. Have is a claim by the plaintiff that the defendant is obligated to her for failure to pay back rentals. <clears throat> Watch the guy. And also Watch the, the guy. Not a, that's what is it, Judge Joe Brown. Attorney. Don't watch Joe Brown. It's the this guy. You need to watch that guy. Apparently, the two of them have taken the test and directed that it be furnished to me for my inspection with whomever. Well, in other words, if he's not the father, then she pays. If he is the father, she uh, gets paid. Father. You'll be paying. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Don't, don't get in here. That ain't bad. Don't get in here. Well, yes. I, I just, I'm, I'm just, not going to try it in the court. I'm, well, just, just chill just a little yes, bit. Sir. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Your Honor. <laughs> Judge Joe Brown. You know how to act better. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I ain't trying to, I ain't trying to show out. Stop. Would you stop? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll try not to. Can you hold still, or are you under the influence? Um, under the influence. Hey. Under the influence. Not right now. Under the influence. But that woman down, <laughs> she done drove me down under influence a lot of things that I said I'd never do. He gonna lie. Oh, how can lie. I? Tell when it's the truth. Lie. God knows. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wouldn't bring him into it. Hey, you please. Man, how would you take care of him if officially you're unemployed? What's Thank you. I wasn't unemployed then. You were unemployed. I wasn't unemployed then. Yes, you were. But I was still in no. Uh, excuse me, Your Honor. Oh. He was, he was, now he was doing that. But he was, he was receiving his daughter's social security checks for her mother's death. Oh and he wasn't giving me none like that. Excuse Everybody, me. Excuse, excuse, excuse me. me. Were you, re let, let him go. Let him go. Let him tell the truth. Let him tell the truth. Okay, I'm just, just let, so, let, let him go. I have a purpose. <laughs> You're showing a classic example. All that kinetic okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you know, it's just hard on me. You're showing the something. residual effects from, so you've already said that you were moving merchandise. I was, I was, I'm not lying, I'm not denying. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm here to tell the truth. Not, didn't I say, how I, didn't I raise my right hand? I don't care who hear the truth. The only one can <laughs> condemn me is God. But, Your Honor, you uh, might You may get a, a, a little remark. He worketh in mysterious ways. Don't he? Don't he? Yes. Amen. He does. He works through uh, you right now. <laughs> Whatever you decide. You candidly admitted that you've been moving merchandise. Oh, hey. Arkansas know it. Who don't know it? When was the last time you've been selling? I ain't sold no dope in a long time, y'all. I've been smoking dope and the reason why. You want to know the reason why? For 38 years, I said I never smoked no dope. For 38 years. But I just, I found out one thing. Never say what you want. The symptoms he is exhibiting, in my experience, he is actively under the influence. Mm -hmm. oh. He's a crackhead. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I used to admit that. No, he don't. No, he didn't. Uh, not at first. No, he didn't. Uh, he <laughs> but now I've the now. impression this is a nice, interesting little thing on a TV show. He's under oath. She is, in fact, a retired deputy sheriff. I ain't and, no secret. I got uh, excuse, me, still in excuse me. The testimony here that you give is an under oath subject to penalties of perjury. There you go. Excuse me. And what I have here is a confession by somebody that looks like they're still on extended parole is a habitual offense. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> you saw what I was talking about. That's crack dancing. <clears throat> Schizophrenia is caused from uh, too much dopamine in the mesolimbic pathway. It is normally caused by a hereditary imbalance or a disease state that affects this area. Since cocaine and amphetamines increase dopamine in this area, it can trigger stimulant-induced paranoid schizophrenia. The main effects are auditory, visual, or tactile hallucinations and paranoid delusions. Stimulant-induced psychosis is imposed, impossible to differentiate from organic psychosis. Psychotic symptoms may disappear with abstinence, but it may take hours, days, or even months. It took about three days for my friend, I'm sorry, my student, uh, to recover from, uh, from uh, her psychotic episode. One-third to one-half of chronic co cocaine users will, will develop uh, mild uh, transient uh, paranoia 
the other problem that she has is she has panic attacks. Um, and sometimes when she's driving down the road, she has to stop because she can't handle it. Uh, she's on Clonopin, and or she was. I don't know what's going on now, but she was on Clonopin to try to to control uh, these these panic attacks. Uh, they would find her. Um, she lived on a farm, and they would find her curled up in in the hayloft uh, because she uh, she was uh, panicking so much. With repeated use after a psychotic episode, smaller and smaller doses will trigger psychotic episodes. And this is what I told her. I told her you can't use anymore. If you use, then then you may be gone forever. Polydrug use is very common among cocaine users because uh, the uh, uh, individual may need chemical assistance to come down off their stimulation. Uh, the most common drugs used with cocaine are, are alcohol, heroin, sedative hypnotics, and nicotine. A person who smokes cigarettes is 22 times more likely to use uh, cocaine than a non-smoker. While the purity of cocaine coming into the country averages 80 to 90 percent, most marketed cocaine has been cut with substances to increase profits. They use baby laxatives, they use lactose, uh, vitamin B, aspirin, mannitol, sugar, uh, tetra tetracaine, uh, which is a form of, uh, uh, is another cane, and procaine, they use procaine as well. Of course, that would increase the uh, the level of of the uh, alkaloid in the in the substance. Injecting any drug is dangerous, but injecting street drugs is especially so. The user can never be sure of the purity of the drug. The drug may be contaminated with dangerous substances that are not meant to be introduced into the human body. Bacteria and viruses may be introduced. 50 to 90 percent of IV drug users are infected with hepatitis C from using contaminated needles. And uh, as a matter of fact, my, uh, my student, uh, who was the, the meth user, did have hepatitis C, and she was afraid she was going to die from it. It was really messing her liver up. And, uh, now there is a, a cure for hepatitis C. So potentially some of these people will will not uh, will, will recover. Manufacturers and refiners of cocaine have known that in the pa in the paste or free base state, cocaine could be smoked without destroying the euphoric uh, properties. When free base is mixed with marijuana and smoked, it is, it is referred to as bazooka, bazooko, or pasta. This form of ingestion gives the user a more intense and immediate effect than snorting. And the way you freebase is that you have to cook the uh, the paste. Uh, you have to cook the paste with some kind of accelerant. Uh, ether is is often used as a uh, as an accelerant. Um, ether is heavier than air, uh, so it's a it's a it's a gas, but it's heavier than air. It's really kind of interesting. You can if you pour it on a table, you can watch it run off the table. Uh, as if it were water, but it's a gas. Uh, so it, it, it seeks the lowest point. Really kind of fascinating. Uh, so um, uh, Richard Pryor was freebasing uh, with ether, and uh, he, so he's cooking it, and he's, pour, he's pouring the, uh, trying to pour the ether as an accelerant, and he poured too much of it, and it ran down his throat, and it caught on fire, and, well, it was on fire, uh, that's how he was cooking his free base. It uh, burned his face. It burned his lungs. It went down into his lungs. Didn't quite make it all the way into his lungs, but it burned his, his esophagus. He was in the hospital for an extended length of time. They thought he was going to die, but eventually he came back. But uh, he died relatively young. He died in his, in his early 60s. Um, how much of that had to do with uh, with his cocaine usage and his... The damage he did to himself by freebasing. Another tragedy, another celebrity tragedy from freebasing. Uh, Ricky Nelson uh, had a whole group of individuals that used to travel with him. Uh, his girlfriend was a freebaser, and she's they're taking off in the airplane. And of course, they couldn't do this in the airport. They needed to wait until 
until they got in, onto the plane. They got onto the plane. She's freebasing, and they started taking off, and she dropped a can of ether, and it, uh, of course, ether is heavy. Uh, it's, it's a heavy uh, gas, so and it seats the lowest point, so this stuff's running down into the back of the plane as they're taking off. Uh, the fire from her, her lighter lit the, uh, the, uh, the ether, and it just went all the way down to the back of the plane. The plane blew up, uh, and everybody on, on board was killed, of course, but it was because that's how Ricky Nelson died um, from a, a freebasing accident on, uh, while he was flying from his girlfriend as lovely as that is. Cracker Freebase has four properties that make it a sought commodity. Uh, the melting point, point is higher of Freebase, 195 degrees, compared to the powder, which uh, melts at 98 degrees. It reaches the brain faster when smoked. This form is more readily absorbed by the fat cells in the brain, giving it a more intense reaction. Higher doses of cocaine can be ingested a, short, a shorter period of time, and that's why people Freebase but like I said, it's fairly dangerous. It can be dangerous if you're not careful. And there's two cases where people weren't careful. Any smoked cocaine product will produce a more intense effect than snorted cocaine. This is true even though most of the cocaine product is lost in the air, 75% in a pipe and 50% in a cigarette. Hence, more cocaine has to be smoked to get a strong effect. Even when cocaine is smoked or injected, the drug is metabolized rapidly, 15 to 20 minutes, and must be renewed to get a strong effect. Crack gives a rush that only lasts a few seconds, and euphoria and ex excitation that only lasts a few minutes, 5 to 20. As soon as the effect dissipates, the individual feels irritable, dysphoric, uh, which is another word for uneasy, and anxious. For this reason, crack is almost always smoked in a binge pattern. Crack does have some fairly unpleasant side effects. It makes you thirsty. It makes you cough. <clears throat> it gives you tremors, dry skin, slurred speech, blurred vision. It causes uh, a condition called crack keratosis, uh, keratitis, uh, abrasion of the eye, uh, crack thumb uh, hands, thumb or hands uh, where it burns your hand. It calluses your thumb from lighting the crack pipe. You have to flick that thing over and over and over again. Uh, crack burns, uh, facial burns from lighting the pipe. The pipes have to be relatively small, relatively short, so you're, you're lighting this thing right next to your face. Psychological side effects of smoking crack, uh, paranoia, craving of, uh, for the drug, uh, asocial behavior, uh, attention problems, irritability, drug dreams, uh, hyperexcitability, visual and auditory hallucinations, depression, uh, cocaine psychosis, and high-risk sexual behavior. Respiratory side effects from smoking crack, uh, chest pains, pneumonia, uh, coughs, uh, crack lung, which is a decreased ability to diffuse your CO2, uh, hemorrhaging, uh, respiratory failure, uh, death due to anesthetization of respiratory center in the medulla. One of the things that happens, well, remember that this stuff is uh, vasoconstrictor. Uh, so once it wears off, then your blood vessels open up. Well, if you've created a break in your, in your blood vessel from uh, shrinking it so much, uh, then it will hemorrhage, and it's really hard uh, to, to stop the, the hemorrhage. Uh, when people were snorting cocaine, uh, I was working in a, a, an emergency room in Omaha, and we'd get people that would come in with bloody noses, and we couldn't get them stopped. And normally what you would do, uh, you would uh, put ice on it until it stopped bleeding, and we would do that, but it just wouldn't stop bleeding because the, the break was too great. Uh, so a last-ditch effort, the last thing we could do was to go in there and cauterize the uh, the hemorrhage. In other words, what we're doing is we're cooking it, uh, we're destroying it so it'll stop bleeding is what we're doing. We're, we're destroying the blood vessel. Of course, you can't do that very often because where's the blood flow going to come come to uh, from in your in your nose in the in the cartilage? Uh, so you know that was always the last thing that we tried if we couldn't get the guy to stop bleeding. 
we would go in there and cauterize the uh, their nasal passages. It's never the first thing, even no matter if they were their blood was you know they were running out, they were losing um, pints and pints of blood. Actually, usually your nose doesn't bleed that much, but uh, I'm, you can't <laughs> you can't just keep giving them blood and letting it run out their nose. So we would cauterize it. Always the last thing that you'd do. <clears throat> Nobody ever wanted to do that because eventually they would have to have reconstructive surgery on their on their cartilage in their nose. Cracker freebase can be mixed with marijuana or create uh, to create caviar, champagne, grimmies, fry daddies, coca puffs, uh, hubba, or woolies. Cracker freebase. Let's mix it with marijuana. Good idea. Users may uh, combine crack with PCP or ketamine to make space basing, whack, or tragic magic. Mixing crack with tar heroin creates speedball, uh, hot rocks, or belushi rocks. And there's a reason why uh, heroin and uh, cocaine mixed together uh, is called belushi rocks. Um, one night, John Belushi was speedballing. His girlfriend gave him an injection, and it killed him. Um, it was, what, 10 years later that Chris Farley was doing the same thing. He was speedballing like his comedy hero, John Belushi, and it killed him. Uh, so we have uh, two uh, comedy giants who were who died speedballing. And speedballing is uh, uh, heroin mixed with cocaine. When crack or cocaine is mixed with wine, it is called crack coolers. As cool as that is. In 2004, 4,500 deaths occurred from the direct and indirect effect of cocaine. Cocaine overdose doesn't always kill, but results in tachycardia and hyperventilation, accompanied by a feeling of impending death. A death usually results from cardiac arrest, seizure, stroke, respiratory failure, and hyperthermia. Social consequences, because using crack can lead to risky sexual behavior, Children are sometimes produced in circumstances that are not optimum. Crack smokers have social problems, and they don't relate to their own offspring any better. Crack smokers show high rates of neglect, abandonment, and abuse of their children. There are high rates of single and no-parent families. Women willing to trade sex for crack are very common, and then it starts all over again. Uh, the other problem is if they have children, sometimes they will, they will prostitute out their children as children and sometimes as infants uh, for, uh, for a fix, as ugly as that is. Uh, there were cases of women selling their babies on the Navajo Nation over the last uh, four or five years uh, to get, uh, to get uh, methamphetamine. This is not uncommon and this is not, this is not pretty. This is not good for the kids and it certainly doesn't help the individual. <clears throat> um, let's see, how can I explain this? Um, up on the uh, Rocky Boy Reservation, uh, there was a lady with two kids. She had a, uh, her son was two and a half and her daughter was uh, a year, I think. <clears throat> anyway, so she would have house parties and house parties are where you accumulate a lot of, uh, uh, of meth and uh, you, you people will pay you to come to their house to use the meth. It's, it's uh, an, an ugly situation. Uh, and of course these people are on meth so they don't go to sleep and they, they drink a lot uh, and they you know they party as much as they want. Oh, uh, she was having a house party and uh, what she discovered was that uh, her son and her daughter had both been molested uh, during the house party. And of course, this lasted, the house party lasted, supposed to start on Friday night and end on Sunday, but this one went on until Wednesday. And she, she had no clue who did it. She had no clue who had been there because she was high most of the time and, and wasn't aware of what was going on. Well, eventually, of course, they took the children away and they gave them to the grandparents. Uh, and uh, so everybody thinks everything's going to go okay. But the grandparents, of course, didn't believe in 
that her, their daughter could do something so horrible. So they let her have them back. And, of course, she had another house party. Same thing happened. Uh, then they took them away from the, the uh, grandparents, and they gave them to uh, one of her sisters. Uh, but they'd been molested twice. Uh, these kids were malnourished. Uh, while they were, they were at the house party, people uh, testified that they had uh, all they had to eat. Uh, they didn't have. They had chips and beer, and that's all they had in the house. Uh, chips and beer and and uh, marijuana and uh, uh, crystal meth. Anyway, so it was it was a really ugly situation. Physical and mental effects of cocaine and amphetamines are similar. Cocaine is about twice as expensive. Cocaine gives us a greater rush and more intense high than amphetamines, but amphetamines allow for more prolonged energy. Amphetamines effect lasts uh, six to nine times longer. Amphetamines are more likely to cause addiction. Amphetamines are synthetic stimulants that provide similar effects as cocaine, but cheaper and more prolonged. Amphetamines are called uppers, speed, crack, crystal, ice, shabu, and glass. Amphetamines are snorted, they're injected. Amphetamines are ingested orally. Worldwide, 33 million people used amphetamines and methamphetamines in 2003. Speed used to come in several forms. Amphetamines, cross tops, white crosses, and cartwheels. Uh, my ex-wife was pushing white crosses. I know that because she brought her stash with her to, uh, to uh, Lubbock, Texas, where I was stationed at the time. And when I found them, I threw them away. She said, you just threw away $300 worth. Of anyway, I threw them away, along with a baggie full of, uh, a trash bag full of marijuana. Uh, because I didn't want to get in trouble. I certainly didn't want to get in trouble. I didn't want that stuff in, around my kids. Uh, by, bifetamine is uh, black beauties. Uh, dexedrine are referred to as dexies or beans. Uh, benzedrine is known as bennies. And methadrine is, doesn't have a cool nickname like all the rest of them. These are what we used to see all the time back in the 70s and 80s. These are the uh, amphetamine uh, amphetamines that we saw, the speed. Amphetamines were first synthesized in 1887. It was used by both sides during World War II. It was used as a diet pill in the 1950s and 1960s. The hippies fueled their psychedelic experience with street speed, marijuana, and LSD. Amphetamines are fairly easy to manufacture. Uh, just like LSD is relatively easy if you have a any knowledge in chemistry, usually you can cook yourself some of this stuff. Amphetamines became a Schedule II drug in 1970, and there's a reason why it happened in 1970. What was going on in 1970? Well, what was happening was uh, the Civil Rights Movement was, was fairly active, and the anti-war movement was exploding all over the United States. So we had all of these uh, counterculture people that were leading the charge to stop the war in Vietnam. <clears throat> so how in the world, uh, you know, protesting is legal in the United States, so you can protest all you want. Uh, so they needed to break up these protests. Well, what they decided to do was to create all of these, uh, to uh, take these drugs that had been uh, out and about for, uh, d for decades, they decided to make them uh, Schedule II drugs, and since they were they were controlled substances, now you could arrest uh, the uh, the hippies for uh, you could arrest them for possession of, of drugs, and that's how they broke up the peace movement in the United States and the civil rights movement. It was kind of an ugly situation, but it's the way it worked. Street chemists began producing crank methamphetamine sulfate and crystal methamphetamine hydrochloride in the 1980s and 1990s. These chemists were able to convert the active ingredients in cold medications, phenylpropanolamine, uh, ephedrine, and pseudoephedrine into crank and crystal. And this was from cold capsules. 
In the 1990s, a new stronger methamphetamine began uh, to be produced called ice glass batu or shabu. It was actually dextroisomer methamphetamine. Uh, it was a lot stronger than the old form. Uh, they were talking about uh, street deaths uh, increased. It like doubled uh, when this stuff hit the hit the streets. Uh, there is a uh, Robocop about uh, this stuff about ice. Uh, they act like it's killing everybody, but it, it doesn't. I mean, it wasn't quite that bad. This form later came to be known as crystal meth, uh, Tina, peanut butter, deadhead, chalk, tweak, yellow rock, glass, or rose quartz speed. The profile of the typical methamphetamine user is a white male, 19 to 40, in the West and especially Hawaii, an equal number of women abuse the drugs as men. Meth is particularly rampant in the gay community, where it is the third most popular drug after alcohol and marijuana. Amphetamines can be cooked in laboratory facilities. Uh, initially, biker gangs cooked the drugs. Hells Angels and Gypsy Jokers were notorious for uh, pushing uh, amphetamines. Recently, uh, Mexican gangs have taken over the manufacture. Uh, the uh, Hells Angels are either dead, in jail, or too old to be playing these games, as are the Gypsy Jokers. Uh, the DEA est estimates that there are over 300 ways to manufacture methamphetamine from pseudoephedrine, and for this reason, cold medicine has been controlled and put behind the counter. Now you can't just go up and grab it off the shelf. You have to ask for it. Snorting methamphetamine is more toxic to the nasal mucosa than snorting cocaine and may cause irritation and pain. The most intense high comes from injecting amphetamines directly into the bloodstream. Sclerosis and pain often result from the injection. Sclerosis is, is hardening of the uh, is where it hardens so that you can't get a needle into it anymore. Methamphetamine is extremely bitter and takes much longer to get the uh, the effect to the brain. Amphetamines last four to six hours as compared to ten to ninety minutes for cocaine. Amphetamines force the increase of the neurotransmitters norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine because it forces the release of these neurotransmitters from terminal vesicles. It reverses the reabsorption pumps, forcing more neurotransmitters into the, into the synapse. It, it, uh, enzymes that metabolize the neurotransmitters are blocked by amphetamines, leaving it in the synapse for a longer period of time. Prolonged use of amphetamines reduce the body's uh, ability to produ produce the affected neurotransmitters. Research shows norepinephrine reduction as long as six months after drug use has ceased. Research also shows a 24% reduction of dopamine resulting in difficulty feeling pleasure. Thus, after heavy use for the individual to feel normal, they have to use the drug. Methamphetamine uh, also causes a degeneration of serotonin producing cells. Research of methamphetamine users found that they had an 11.3% reduction in the gray matter of their hippocampus, cingulate gyrus, paralimbic uh, cortices. These areas affect your craving, mood, emotions, and memory. Oh my goodness. However, brain on methamphetamines are actually larger due to swelling, despite the fact that you've just reduced all the gray matter in the part of your brain that remembers things. <clears throat> Amphetamines cause increased energy, increased heart rate, raised body temperature, uh, rapid respiration, higher blood pressure, dilation of bronchial vessels, uh, appetite suppression. Binging on amphetamines can result in not sleeping for up to three to 10 days. Tolerance of amphetamine is fairly rapid and extreme. A normal dosage is 15 to 30 milligrams. Long-term users may use as much as 5,000 milligrams a day. Effects on these individuals, sleep deprivation, of course, of course heart tox toxicity, blood vessel toxicity, severe malnutrition. Overdose may result in convulsions, hyperthermia, and cardiovascular collapse. Unlike most drugs, amphetamines are abused as much or more by women than men. This may lead to use uh, during pregnancy, which results in irritability baby, irritable baby syndrome. 
uh, intolerance to light and touch, tremors, muscle coordination problems, abnormal reflexes, sucking and swallowing problems, disturbed sleep. Other problems that might occur for a baby born to a methamphetamine user is premature delivery, congenital deformities such as club foot or limb abnormalities, gastric problems, intestines protruding into the stomach, placental separation and hemorrhage being potentially lethal to both mother and baby, interuterine brain hemorrhage and stroke, uh, HIV, hepatitis B and C from the mother. If the baby survives gestation, they may have developmental problems, growth and developmental delays, learning disabilities, increased incidence of ADHD, increased risk for rage disorder, greater incidence of SIDS, disability rates range around 33% of babies who were born uh, from drug from amphetamine using mothers, 33%, one out of every three. Amphetamines produce mild intense euphoria, alertness, sexual feelings, a sense of well-being and confidence. After prolonged use, irritability, paranoia, anxiety, aggression, uh, mental confusion, poor judgment, impaired memory, and hallucinations. Since amphetamines cause an abundance of neurotransmitters that mimic sexual gratification, using the drug becomes a substitute for sexual activity. Amphetamines will also produce violence in people prone to violence because the drug causes people to be suspicious, paranoid, and overconfident. This proclivity for violence among meth users can lead to child abuse and neglect. In Oregon in 2004, 1,850 uh, 1, meth labs were busted and a full 80% of child abuse and neglect cases involved meth users. <clears throat> Excessive amphetamine usage can lead to amphetamine psychosis just as with cocaine. Hallucinations, loss of contact with reality, speech patterns that are indistinguishable from paranoid schizophrenia. Since these symptoms are caused by excess dopamine released by the drug, psychotic episodes can be induced at fairly low doses in individuals prone to excess dopamine. Some individuals may have immediate psychosis, while others may use for years with no problem. Crystal meth seems to have the strongest effect on the brain chemistry, and since it has fewer cardiovascular effects, can be smoked in larger quantities. The result is more severe paranoia, hallucinations, hypervigilant thinking, suicidal depression, and addictive use. 9.4% <clears throat> of children uh, 2 to 17 in the United States have been diagnosed with ADHD in their lifetime. One out of every 10. 8.1% of U.S. adults between 18 and, 20 and 44 have been diagnosed with ADHD. 129,000 children worldwide, 7.2%, have been diagnosed with ADHD. In 2016, 6,100,000 children have been diagnosed with ADHD, up from 4,400,000 in 2003. So as you can see, it is increasing, despite much faster than the, uh, the population is increasing. ADHD is caused by a depletion of dopamine. Amphetamines are used to treat ADHD because they increase dopamine and block its metabolism. Uh, there are, this is, no, this is brand new. Uh, methylphenidate, uh, Ritalin is the most uh, prescribed medication for ADHD. It has 10 million uh, prescriptions per year. Uh, D-amphetamine, Adderall, uh, has 7.7 .7 million prescriptions per year. Stratera, Adomexetine, uh, has 5.8 million prescriptions uh, per year, and uh, a new one is Silert, and we don't have any statistics on Silert. Uh, its chemical name is Pimeline. Amphetamines work on ADHD about 75% of the time, so we're treating all these kids, but only three-quarters of them. Uh, it's, it's working on three-quarters of them. Research shows the other 25% are probably misdiagnosed they probably have some other problem that looks like ADHD, and so they're not reacting to uh, the medication. Research shows that children taking amphetamine therapy for ADHD in the long term 
have an increased risk of alcohol and drug abuse as adults. Half of children with ADHD have comorbid uh, oppositional defiant disorder. If left and treated, these individuals are more likely to progress to more serious problems, stealing, vandalism, arson. In other words, they go from ODD to CD to antisocial personality disorder. One of the main uses for amphetamines throughout the 20th century was as a diet pill. But every time a new drug hit the market, it seemed to cause its own set of problems. One such problem came with the two amphetamines, fentermine, uh, fentermine and finfluramine, marketed as fenfen. Given in tandem, the drugs caused heart valve damage in select women. In 1999, the drugs were taken off the market. Uh, for a while, my wife was on fenfen. Uh, I didn't like it. I didn't want her to do it, but uh, she was trying to lose weight when she was in the service. She didn't have any problems. Thank goodness she didn't have any problems. Uh, stimulants are and have been used all over the world for centuries. Uh, cot is used in the Middle East, a betel nut in the Far East, uh, yohimbi in Africa, and ephedra in the Mediterranean area. Cot is a mild stimulant found in the Middle East. Uh, smuggling of this drug in the United States has become more prevalent as more and more immigrants from the area come into the United States. The key stimulant in the leaf is cathinone, which evaporates if the leaf isn't used within 48 hours after harvesting. This substance is said to produce an effect between caffeine and methamphetamine. Methcathinone is a synthetic version of cathinone. This drug is used extensively in the Horn of Africa and on the Arabian Peninsula. In Yemen, half the population uses cot, and a family may spend one-third of their income on the drug. This drug is the driving force of the economies of many of the countries in the area. The drug is used socially, just like alcohol is used in uh, the United States and Europe. Chronic cot uh, can, uh, use can cause physical exhaustion, suicidal depression when w it's withdrawn. Synthetic cathinone is known as methcathinone. Uh, while this is only found sparingly in the United States, it is much more common in Europe and in fact represents 20% of illicit drug use in the Russian Republic. Methcathinone is much more intense than cot and is as addictive as meth, uh, methamphetamine. <clears throat> With this drug, there is more dopamine reduction and so Parkinsonism is more common. Parkinsonism is uh, tremors and uh, poor uh, gait. It's difficult for these people to walk. Beetle nuts come from the beetle nut palm and are found all over Southern Asia. It is used extensively in India, Pakistan, the Arab world, Taiwan, Malaysia, the Philippines, New Guinea, Polynesia, Southern China, and Africa. Worldwide, 200 to 450 million people use beetle nut. In Taiwan, 17% of men and 1% of women use the substance. One recent controversy in Taiwan is the beetle nut beauties who man beetle nut kiosks while dressed provocatively to attract male customers. Some authorities are demanding more modesty for fear of compromising public morals. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, this is one of the cleaner pictures I can show you of a beetle nut beauty uh, in Taiwan. The addictive ingredient in betel nuts are, is uh, aracoline, which induces uh, an increase of epinephrine and norepinephrine in the central nervous system. <clears throat> this causes a mild euphoria, uh, excitation, and a decrease of fatigue. The juice of the nut is dark red and it stains the mouth red to black, as you can plainly see. Uh, how attractive, black teeth. Aracoline and muscarine are fairly toxic and cause mouth and esophagus irritation that might lead to cancer in the area. 7% <clears throat> of the chronic users develop a cancer. In India, betel nuts are mixed with sweetened tobacco to make a product known as gutka. India, betel nuts and tobacco. Yohimbine is the extract from Yohimbi tree found in Africa. 
The tree is a member of the coffee family, and the extract is bitter and spicy, and often brewed in a similar manner to coffee. The active ingredient in amhimbine is an alpha-2 adrenergic antagonist that increases the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. <clears throat> Yohimbine has been used for centuries as a mild aphrodisiac and a sexual rejuvenator. Yohimbine's sexual side effects seem to stem from its ability to increase penile blood flow. It has been used to treat erectile dysfunction and is reputed to induce sexual arousal in women. The drug does increase blood pressure and heart rate. Male enhancement products include male performance, Yohimbi power, manpower, and aphrodyne. It is also found in Sobe Energy. <clears throat> um, one of my students at, uh, at Ashford was telling me that, uh, you know, I was going through the lecture and I talked about Sobe Energy and she, she got really big eyes and she said, my husband bought a six pack of that stuff. Now I know why he did it. Uh, Yohimbine uh, serves as a local anesthetic uh, in larger doses. It may produce a mild euphoria and sometimes hallucinations. She was mad, and I'm not exactly sure why, but she was angry. At uh, uh, toxic levels, it can produce paralysis of the respiratory system and death. <clears throat> Ephedra is a bush that grows in deserts all over the world. You can find it uh, if you go down to Chinle. I'm sure you can find it. Uh, in that desert environment. The drug that it, it produces is ephedrine. This drug is a mild to moderate stimulant that is used medicinally to treat asthma, narcolepsy, allergies, and low blood pressure. Ephedrine is also known as marwith and mahuang ma and has been used medicinally by the Chinese for 5,000 years. Ephedrine was first synthesized in 1885 and for decades was the only effective treatment for, a for asthma. Ephedrine's effects are less severe than amphetamines, though a toxic level is more likely to lead to psychosis. Ephedrine and pseudoephedrine are the active ingredients in many cold products. They also make up the molecule that is converted to make methamphetamine and methcathinone. This substance has also been implicated in sports doping scandals, and so is banned by the NFL, and it's illegal in Ohio. The sale of cold remedies is now controlled to prevent the hoarding of enough of the substance to convert it into the more destructive drugs. Caffeine is the most popular stimulant in the world, mood and altering drug in the world, habit-forming drug in the world. 85% of the people in the United States consume substantial amounts of caffeine every day, including me. I don't drink that much uh, Mountain Dew, but I do drink Mountain Dew, and it ha does have caffeine in it. Caffeine is naturally found in, uh, actually, I don't drink uh, Mountain Dew. I drink uh, Code Red, which is cherry flavored. <clears throat> caffeine is naturally found in coffee, tea, and chocolate. Caffeine is put in many products to give, a, give us energy. It's found in soda pop, uh, energy drinks, and over-the-counter energy supplements. Water is the most widely consumed beverage in the world. Tea is the second most widely consumed beverage. Tea has been consumed in China for 4,700 years. Tea has been ritualized in many cultures like Japan and China. The English uh, discovered tea from Portuguese traders and the country became obsessed with it. They even fought two wars to get the Chinese to sell them tea. To this day, four o'clock is tea time in England when everyone stops and takes a spot of tea and eats a biscuit. And biscuit to them is a cookie. So they're eating cookies and drinking tea. Uh, they usually mix their tea with milk, uh, making it look kind of muddy. Uh, but that's the way they drink their tea in England. Uh, it's really kind of interesting. Um, I, I watch a lot of British uh, uh, television shows uh, on PBS, and uh, it's, they're always they're always drinking tea. <laughs> it just seems so weird to me that uh, they sit down and somebody pours them a cup of tea. Uh, you know, we don't do that in the United States. I I don't think we do anyway. We certainly don't do it with tea. But it's for tea time is always four o'clock. 
Coffee was uh, first ca cultivated in Ethiopia in 650 AD, and from there slowly spread into a Europe, though along the way many cultures banned it as an intoxicant. In the United States, each coffee drinker consumes an average of 20 pounds of coffee a year. I don't drink coffee at all. Uh, I've only had a couple co uh, cups of coffee my entire life, so I'm not part of that 20 pounds. Eight ounces of brewed coffee will deliver about 135 milligrams of caffeine. That's only eight ounces. That's one, one of those small cups. That's 135 milligrams of of caffeine. Eight ounces of instant coffee will deliver about 95 milligrams of caffeine. Even decaf coffee has about seven milligrams of caffeine. Archaeological evidence indicates that indigenous people in Central America brewed coca products as early as 2,600 years ago. From the Mayans, this practice spread to the rest of South and Central American power brokers, the Aztecs, and the Incans. Coca, coca was uh, originally marketed in, this is different from the coca plant, so don't get the two of them mixed up. This is, this is a great big seed, and the coca plant is leaves. In Europe, as, as an, it was used as an aphrodisiac, but it soon became, became merely candy when it was mixed with sugar because it's kind of bitter. Uh, so even to this day, on Valentine's Day, you give people chocolates. And the reason you do is because in the old days, they thought of, of it as an aphrodisiac. Uh, that St. Valentine, of course, uh, he's the one that, uh, uh, that has something to do with this. Uh, is it an aphrodisiac? Well, uh, strangely enough, it does induce... Uh, certain feelings, I'm not talking about sexual feelings, I'm talking about feelings of affection in women, but it doesn't especially work in men. So if a woman's trying to get to a man's heart, don't give him chocolate. It won't probably won't work. Uh, but a man can give a woman a chocolate. It makes her feel more positively toward, toward the man. Coca has a small amount of caffeine, but other uh, active ingredients in the substance act as stimulants as well. One of them is theobromine, and that may be the reason why people crave chocolate. In the late 19th and early 20th century, manufacturers of cola soft drinks replace, replaced cocaine with caffeine as an energy booster. And we already talked about Coca-Cola having, uh, 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 having cocaine in it before they they switch to co uh, caffeine. Some of the caffeine comes from the cola nut from the African cola tree, but most of the uh, most of it today comes from caffeine removed from decaffeinated coffee. Energy drinks began with the invention of Red Bull in 1987. Yes, energy drinks have only been around since 1987. Red Bull delivers 80 milligrams of caffeine in an 8.3 ounce can. Uh, Red Bull also contains taurine, ginseng, guarana, glucose, B-complex vitamins, minerals, and carbohydrates. Eight ounces of brewed coffee delivers 135 milligrams of caffeine. That's what you need to remember. So when we're comparing um, uh, Red Bull to uh, coffee, or I'm sorry, to, to uh, brewed coffee, uh, then we need to remember the, the figure 135. That's, that's the figure you're trying to hit. Sobe Adrenaline Rush also delivers 80 milligrams of caffeine in an 8.3 ounce can. Uh, Starbucks uh, two shot uh, uh, coffee delivers a whopping 105 milligrams of caffeine in just a 6.5 ounce can. Mountain Dew, 12 ounces of Mountain Dew, a can of Mountain Dew delivers about 54 ounces of uh, milligrams of, uh, of caffeine. Um, that is what? That's less than a third of a cup of coffee. Uh, 12 ounces of Dr. Pepper delivers 41 milligrams of caffeine. 12 ounces of Pepsi-Cola delivers 38 milligrams of caffeine. 12 ounces of Coca-Cola delivers 35 milligrams of caffeine. As we see, it's getting lower and lower and lower. 16 ounces of Rockstar delivers 240 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, and you may think, wow, that's a lot of caffeine. Yeah, it's a lot of caffeine, but it's twice as much as an eight, eight ounce cup of, cup of coffee, which delivers 135. If we drank 16 ounces of brewed coffee, we would have 170 uh, milligrams or 270 milligrams of caffeine. 
So yes, it's it's a bigger can, but and it delivers a lot of caffeine, but coffee delivers more. 16 ounces of full throttle delivers 200 milligrams of caffeine. Once again, you can divide it in half because we're talking about eight uh, ounces of coffee. 16 ounces of Monster delivers 160 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, 16 ounces of Mountain Dew Kickstart delivers 90 uh, milligrams of caffeine. So you can see Kickstart, Monster, Full Throttle, and Rockstar. There's just a lot more of it. A uh, new phenomenon that has hit the bar scene is a drink vodka, uh, to drink vodka mixed with Red Bull. It's known as Birch. It is reputed that this mixture will slow the pro process of getting drunk and result in less of a hangover the, the next morning. Uh, that doesn't work. You get drunk, actually get drunk faster. Um, one of the, the problems they've had with Birch is that uh, it causes the individual to be um, aggressive. Let's not say violent, let's say aggressive. Uh, so um, my son was a bartender for a while. And in several of the bars that he worked at, they would not uh, they would not mix this drink. They would not mix Red Bull with vodka because there was too much danger of the guy deciding that this girl over here was in love with him, and he'd go over and pick a fight with her boyfriend. Deaths due to overconsumption of Red Bull uh, have been uh, led to banning of the drink in several countries. Uh, it's uh, illegal in France, Denmark, and Canada. Actually, they have uh, changed the uh, formula, uh, and you can still find it in Canada, but it's not nearly as strong as, uh, as regular Red Bull that you find in the United States. Guarana is the national drink of Brazil. Guarana comes from the Guarana shrub, which produces beans that have about two times the caffeine as coffee beans. The Brazilian drink normally delivers about 30 milligrams of caffeine in a 12-ounce can. Mate is a plant uh, whose leaves are brewed like tea. Mate is the national drink of Argentina and delivers between 35 to 130 milligrams of caffeine per 8-ounce serving. 3% of the world's caffeine comes from mate. Caffeine is a very bitter uh, chemical. It's an alkaloid in a class of chemicals called xanthines. It is found in more than 60 plants around the world. The half-life of caffeine is three to seven hours. It takes 15 to 35 hours for caffeine to clear the system. Swedes average 425 milligrams of caffeine per day. The English average 445 milligrams of caffeine per day, much of that delivered through their tea. Americans average 211 milligrams of caffeine a day. 17% of it comes from tea, 16% of it comes from soft drinks, 60% of it comes from coffee. About half of all Americans drink 3.3 cups of coffee a day. 20% of uh, U.S. adults consume more than 350 milligrams of caffeine per day. 3% of U.S. adults drink more than 650 milligrams of caffeine per day. 65% of, uh, of the 450 different soft drinks produced in the United States contain caffeine. Now let me tell you something about caffeine. Caf some people are sensitive to caffeine and other people aren't. Now interestingly enough, I come from a family where my father wasn't sensitive to caffeine and my mother was, or yeah, she was. Uh, my dad could drink a bucket of, of, of coffee every day and have no effect whatsoever. Uh, he uh, had um, two heart surgeries where he had to go off coffee for a week and then he went into the hospital for his surgery and he was in the hospital for a couple weeks and while he was in the hospital he wasn't allowed caffeine he wasn't allowed any coffee and he had no effect from it didn't have headaches didn't have any withdrawal symptoms so he wasn't really sensitive to caffeine my mother on the other hand if she especially later on in her life when she hit her 70s, 80s, and 90s, if she even took a sip of coffee, it would give her heart palpitations. And if she drank too much of the coffee, it made it look like she was having a heart attack. So she was really sensitive to caffeine. Now, I'm not sensitive to caffeine at all. It doesn't bother me at all. I've gone off of, of Mountain Dew several times. Uh, no withdrawal symptoms whatsoever. My son's the same way. He doesn't have any withdrawal symptoms either. So he's not sensitive to caffeine. I'm not sensitive to caffeine. And my dad wasn't sensitive to caffeine. 
My mother is, uh, was, I'm sorry, my mother was sensitive to caffeine. I have a brother <clears throat> who um, wouldn't drink any coffee. If he drank coffee, he, he dil diluted it with a lot of sugar and a lot of milk, which I thought was silly because he just got the, a, 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 a sip of, co of coffee in that whole drink. Uh, one time he was traveling, his, his daughter was married to a man who was in the Navy, and he was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. And for some reason, they didn't want her to be alone. Uh, so on the weekends, they would drive to Norfolk, Virginia from Muncie, Indiana. Well, one weekend, uh, only my brother went. And so he was driving to, uh, uh, to Norfolk, and he got tired, and he decided he would drink a, a bottle of Mountain Dew. So he drank a bottle of Mountain Dew, and the next thing he knew, uh, he ended up in uh, Maine, in Bangor, Maine. Uh, and he called. Uh, he had been uh, hospitalized because he was so jittery. Uh, he went to the hospital, or he went to the emergency room, and they hospitalized him. He was in there for a couple days, uh, but he called me on the phone and he said, "Don't drink Mountain Dew. The stuff's hallucinogenic. It'll make you crazy." And of course, I've never had any. Any any of those effects from it, but my mother, my brother is highly sensitive to caffeine, so he can't drink it at all. Uh, caffeine is used, so, so there are differences. That's what I'm trying to say. Some people are really sensitive to it, and some people aren't sensitive to it at all. Caffeine is used in several prescriptions and over-the-counter medications. It's used in bronchodilators, decongestants, diuretics, analgesics, alertness aids appetite suppressants, menstrual pain controllers. As a vasoconstrictor, it can work on migraine headaches as well. Unfortunately, if you're not sensitive to, to caffeine, none of these things work. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they always try them out, special vaso, uh, bronchodilators and, and, uh, and uh, analgesics. Uh, if it doesn't work on you, it just doesn't work. Uh, so they'll give you something else, something without caffeine in it probably. Uh, caffeine works by inhibiting the effect of adenosine. Adenosine is a, a neuromodulator that depresses mood. It induces sleep. It has anticonvulsant properties. It causes low blood pressure, slows the heart rate, and dilates the blood vessels. When you take uh, caffeine, of course, it changes all of that. It, uh, it makes you uh, more excited and less depressed. It, uh, it keeps you from sleeping. Uh, it, it, there's a greater prob possibility that you'll have a, a convulsion. Uh, it raises your blood pressure, it raises your heart rate, and it uh, constricts your blood vessels. And of course, as I said, uh, caffeine is controlled by your heredity. And strangely enough, I have heredity that goes both ways. My, my mother and my brother uh, are highly sensitive to caffeine, and I am not sensitive to caffeine at all. Uh, to those sensitive to caffeine, 350 milligrams per day may cause anxiety, insomnia, gastric irritation, high blood pressure, nervousness, and flushed face. One study where subjects were given 500 milligrams of caffeine showed a 32% elevation of the stress hormones for an extended period of time. Caffeine is lethal at 10 grams. That's 100 cups of coffee or 185 cans of Mountain Dew. Good luck getting all that into your system so that you can kill yourself. In susceptible people, too much caffeine can trigger nervousness. Caffeine is one of the sub substances that people prone to panic attacks should avoid. If you're a counselor, you should ask your clients about their caffeine consumption as sensitivity and excess amounts might create artificial anxiety. Excess caffeine consumption can lower the fertility in women. 350 milligrams per day will not only make it less likely that a woman will get pregnant, but will double the chance of a miscarriage. Excessive caffeine consumption has also been implicated in a woman's developing benign lumps in her breasts. Researchers also feel that caffeine may make it difficult to lose weight because caffeine triggers the release of insulin, which metabolizes sugar and in turn creates a deficit in the blood which causes hunger. Uh, when my daughter was trying to get pregnant, uh, she went off of caffeine, and she stayed off of caffeine until she had the baby, until she had my grandson. Um, wise thing to do. She's, she's a good girl. She stayed away from 
from all the, the negative things that can possibly cause a problem. And of course, my grandson, as you have seen pictures of him, he is perfect. Since there are a number of different hereditary structures that dictate sensitivity and tolerance to caffeine, talking about amount, amounts and effects uh, varies from one individual to another. High caffeine consumers may actually get sleepy when only consuming small amounts of the substance because it activates the adenosine receptor sites. Withdrawal symptoms from caffeine begins after 12 to 24 hours of abstinence and peaks about 24 to 48 hours after abstinence starts. The symptoms can last for two days to two weeks, throbbing headaches, sleepiness, fatigue, uh, lethargy, depression, decreased alertness, sleep problems, irritability, flu-like symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and muscle pains or stiffness. And as I said, my father had, uh, had those two heart surgeries, uh, had to go off of coffee for an extended length of time, no withdrawal symptoms, uh, I've gone off of Mountain Dew several times. I could go off of it now. Uh, no withdrawal symptoms whatsoever. Nicotine, uh, so we're, we'll stop talking about uh, caffeine. Uh, nicotine comes from the leaves of the tobacco plant. The tobacco plant is a member of the nightshade family, which also includes tomatoes, belladonna, henbane, and petunias. In the United States, 90% of the tobacco is delivered to its users as cigarettes. In India, 85% of all men use tobacco in the form of chewing tobacco. So cigarettes aren't that common in India, but they are in the United States. But you do see men spitting. And uh, for that reason, if you've, uh, yeah, I've never been to India, but I have seen the signs that says, please do not spit on the sidewalk. A lot of men uh, chewing tobacco. Tobacco came uh, to the old world from the, the Americas, and it originally was smoked in pipes. In the 18th century, people began chewing the leaves and snorting the powder into their noses as snuff. Uh, when they snorted into their nose, they snorted in as a powder. Uh, it makes them sneeze, and they say it's orgasmic. And that's the reason they do it, as strange as that may seem. Smokeless tobacco continued to be the most popular use of tobacco until World War I. So if you see an old uh, cowboy movie and they're smoking cigarettes, eh, probably not. Uh, cigarettes were considered uh, feminine uh, at that time. Uh, sure, you could roll your own, but most people smoked cigars or chewed tobacco before World War I. Around World War I, packaged cigarettes became popular in the trenches of Europe because it delivered a lot more tobacco or a lot more nicotine in a shorter period of time. And the problem in, uh, in a uh, trench was the fact that you didn't want the enemy to know where you were. So you needed uh, just a little bit of smoke uh, and you needed it to, to go out really quickly. If you're smoking a cigar, that can take, it, that can take a long time. It can take you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes uh, to smoke a cigar up to an hour. Uh, so you're sitting there with that red glow, and of course the probability that a sniper is going to spot you is fairly is fairly uh, high. But if you're smoking a cigarette, you can smoke a cigarette in a couple minutes. Cigarette rolling machines improved, and that's one of the other reasons why uh, they became popular uh, in the uh, early 20th century. Cigarettes uh, used a milder form of tobacco, which allowed deeper inhalation of the tobacco, therefore more nicotine got into your system because it, since it was a milder form of tobacco, you could draw it down into your lungs. Uh, uh, you couldn't do that with pipes and you couldn't do that with cigars because the uh, tobacco was too harsh. Mass production produced lower prices, advertising popularized the product, more aggressive marketing brought the product around the world. Heavy smokers in the United States will smoke 20 to 40 cigarettes per day. U.S. tobacco users spend $89 billion a year on tobacco products. 24.9% of the population, over 12, 60.5 uh, million Americans, smoked cigarettes in the past month. That's about one out of every four people over the age of 12. 51 million Americans smoke cigarettes every day. 13.6 million Americans smoke cigars every day. 2.2 million Americans smoke tobacco in pipes every day. 7.7 .7 million Americans use smokeless tobacco every day. Smokeless tobacco comes in three forms. Moist snuff that is put in the mouth next to the gum. Uh, that's called snuff too, I think, isn't it? Powdered or dry snuff, which is uh, drawn up 
uh, up the nose and loose leaf chew which is put in the mouth and chewed. The active ingredient in tobacco is nicotine. Nicotine is a highly poisonous alkaloid that is bitter, smelly, and colorless. Uh, tobacco leaves hold 2 to 5% nicotine. Smoke, a smoking tobacco delivers nicotine to the brain in 5 to 8 seconds. Smokeless tobacco delivers nicotine to the brain in 3 to 8 minutes. Cigarettes contain 10 milligrams of nicotine, but a typical smoker will only get 1 to 3 milligrams into their system with one cigarette. 70 milligrams of nicotine is fatal, so you can actually poison people by giving them nicotine, and they rarely look for it. So this is not a bad way to poison your enemies. Chewing tobacco will deliver 4.5 milligrams of nicotine to the brain, while snuff will deliver 3.5 milligrams. So that's the stuff you put in the, your cheek, like Copenhagen. The first cigarette of the day, well, let me talk about this for a second. Chewing tobacco, of course, is just loose leaf tobacco, uh, but snuff is uh, impregnated with fiberglass. And the reason it's got fiberglass in it, I don't know if you've ever sat on something where the fiberglass was coming off and with your, against your bare legs, but the fiberglass got into your skin. It does the same thing if you put it in mucous membrane. If you put it in between your, your cheek and gums, it will cut your cheek and gums, <clears throat> these micro tears, and that will deliver the nicotine into your system a lot faster. That's why they put the uh, fiberglass in, uh, in uh, uh, Copenhagen. And they put it in all of them, and, uh, and that's the reason why. They want it to get into your system. The faster it gets into, into your system, the more addictive you will become for that substance. The first cigarette of the day will raise the heart rate by 10 to 20 beats and the blood pressure by 5 to 10 units. Nicotine affects the central nervous system and disrupts the uh, following neurotransmitters. Endorphins, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, and acetylcholine. Nicotine mimics acetylcholine, filling nicotinic acetylcholine receptor sites, exaggerating the cholinergic effects, increasing your heart rate, your blood pressure, your memory. It actually uh, makes you remember things better. Learning reflexes, aggression, sleep, sexual activity, and mental acuity. Dopamine makes a smoker feel satisfied and calm. Uh, thus, a cigarette uh, be both excites and tranquilizes. People continue to take in the tobacco toxins because it is a social ritual. There is also a ritual aspect to the lighting up and smoking. Smoking is perceived as an adult activity. It manipulates your mood. It increases your dopamine. It appears to be rebellious. It is sexually attractive. It controls appetite, leading to weight loss. And nicotine is highly craved. Nicotine suppresses the appetite and increases metabolism. The average smoker weighs 6 to 9 pounds lighter than the same size non-smoker. It may be the fear of putting on weight that keeps some smokers from stopping. Smokers may also be self-medicating to combat depression. Smokers are twice as likely as non-smokers to experience major depression. Smokers who have experienced at least one major episode of depression are less likely to succeed in smoking secession. What is going on here? What is happening is every time you take a a, a puff of a, of a cigarette, let me do this again, puff of a cigarette, it increases your dopamine. You get a dopamine spike, and dopamine makes you feel good. So if you smoke cigarettes, it increases your dopamine level. Uh, if you've ever been around somebody who uh, was suffering from schizophrenia, a lot of times they are chain smokers, and the reason they are chain smokers is because uh, uh, schizophrenia uh, causes a, um, a problem with your dopamine. It's a reduction of dopamine receptor sites. So by increasing the amount of dopamine, by smoking cigarettes, it makes you feel more normal. That's why they smoke. And that may be why people smoke. They are trying to combat depression. Smokers who have experienced at least one major episode of depression are less likely to succeed in smoking cessation. Nicotine creates an intense craving when a select level is not maintained in the bloodstream and the brain. The mere act of lighting up act activates the nucleus accumbens, giving the smoker a sense of reward. The rush is similar to the feeling that a heroin user gets 
when they relapse after an abstinent period. This use uh, to escape withdrawal symptoms is called negative drug reinforcement. Only a few hours of smoking leads to neural adaptation to the toxicity of the, of the nicotine. The first morning hit after a long night's sleep is said to feel especially rush-like as the individual builds the nicotine level back to their daytime norm. Unlike other drugs, nicotine does not continue to build up a tolerance, but the smoker finds a level of comfort that they attempt to maintain. Withdrawal from nicotine causes headaches, nervousness, fatigue, hunger, severe irritability, poor concentration, depression, increased appetite, sleep disturbances, intense nicotine craving. The individual has experienced a true physiological dependence as the individual has created an excess number of nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptors that are screaming to be occupied. Without the nicotine to occupy these sites, the result is irritability and discontent. The smoker needs the tobacco to feel normal. Researchers now realize that the feelings of relaxation and well-being that smokers feel when they light up is actually the feeling of having the withdrawal symptoms subdued. Nicotine addiction is a more powerful addiction than any other. While 23 million people have tried cocaine, only 600,000 uh, people are we weekly users and a rare few on a daily basis. 72 million people have tried marijuana, but only 6.8 million use, use on a weekly basis and only a fraction on a daily basis. 198 million people have tried alcohol, but only 48 million use it weekly and only 20 million on a daily basis. 162 million people have tried tobacco, 60 million smoke weekly, and 37 million smoke daily. Nearly one quarter of the people who try tobacco continue to use the drug daily, as compared to fr fractions with other drugs and 10% of the people using alcohol. 80% of smokers say that they want to quit, 10% want to limit the amount they smoke, only 10% of smokers want to continue, yet 100% do continue to smoke or chew. Other countries have more serious problems with tobacco than the United States. China's use is 50% higher than the United States, which if you remember is about 25%. Uh, England's use is 40% higher than the United States, and Japan's use is 50% higher. Globally, 12% of women and 47% of men smoke. There may be a pre predilection to use tobacco. The DRD2A1 allele is seen as the culprit. A teen who smokes is three times more likely to abuse alcohol, three times more likely to abuse marijuana, 22 times more likely to abuse cocaine. Only 8% of black teens use tobacco. 15.7% of Hispanic teens use tobacco. 25.7% 25, 25 of white teens use tobacco. So as you can see, tobacco is a much more serious problem on, among uh, Caucasians than blacks or Hispanics. Nicotine contains from 4,000 to 48,000 chemicals uh, 400 are toxins, 69 are known cancer-causing substances. Worldwide, it is estimated that smoking causes 5 million premature deaths per year. 392,000 of these people are in the United States. 264,000 men and women, 178,000 women. 264,000 men and 178,000 women. Uh, what do they die from? They die from lung cancer heart disease, and lung disease. An additional 50,000 people die from secondhand smoke. 8.6 million Americans have at least one serious illness caused by smoking. It is estimated that a smoker loses 10 years off their life. Smoking accelerates a process of atherosclerosis by increasing low-density fats, increasing blood coagulability. It makes your platelets sticky. Uh, triggering cardiac arrhythmias, reducing uh, micro-respiratory function by introducing carbon monoxide into the bloodstream. Carbon monoxide has a 230 times a stronger affinity for hemoglobin than oxygen does. So if carbon monoxide is in the area, then it will adhere to your hemoglobin, making 
your hemoglobin non-functional. That's why people die so readily of carbon monoxide poisoning. It is also a vasoconstrictor. One third of all smoking deaths are due to cardiovascular disease. 35,000 of these are from secondhand smoke. Bronchopulmonary diseases are far more prevalent among smokers than non-smokers. This includes emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as COPD. Children who live with smokers suffer from more asthma, more colds, and more bronchitis. 80 to 90 percent of all COPD deaths are due to smoking. Men who smoke uh, are 22 times more likely to develop lung cancer than men who don't. Women who smoke are 12 times more likely to develop lung cancer than women who don't. 85% of men and 75% of women with lung cancer smoke. About 15% of mothers smoke during pregnancy. Nicotine and the byproduct carbon monoxide change some of the positive properties in the blood. Carbon monoxide blocks oxygen, oxygen transport. Nicotine makes platelets more sticky, increasing the possibility of a clot forming. Babies born to smokers have lower birth weights. They are, have a higher incidence of uh, sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, women who smoke during pregnancy are twice as likely to, to uh, miscarry and have spontaneous abortions as non-smokers. Children whose mothers smoke during pregnancy have a four times greater chance of having ADHD. Conduct, they also have a greater affinity, uh, a greater chance of, of developing conduct disorder, drug depend dependence, asthma, chronic bronchitis, and chronic respiratory symptoms. Smokeless tobacco can be addicting as smoking because tobacco is smokeless, uh, in smokeless tobacco forms, forms contain more nicotine than smoked tobacco. Uh, people use more smokeless tobacco when they use. Smokeless tobacco has a higher pH, allowing it to pass into the capillaries, capillaries more readily. One dip of smokeless tobacco delivers the same amount of nicotine as three to four cigarettes. At least the dipper is less likely to, to get lung cancer, but they're more likely to get uh, oral cancer. Gums are inflamed from use, uh, causing more dental problems. Usually the, uh, the inflammation has to do with the, all that um, uh, fiberglass that I was talking about before. It cuts the gums. It makes wounds in your, in your gums and lips and your lip. Higher risk of uh, oral cancer, pharyngeal cancer, esophageal cancer, cheek cancer, and gum cancer. Uh, I had a neighbor uh, who chewed tobacco as an adult for some reason. He was a judge. And uh, it caused cancer, and it got into his salivary glands. He had to have his salivary glands removed. He had to have some of the muscles in his, in his neck uh, and his... Uh, uh, jaw re uh, removed. So uh, he is permanently stuck with his chin stuck to his his uh, chest. He can't raise his head up because the, all of those um, muscles that control that uh, are gone. They had to cut them out because they were cancerous. A famous singer of the 1950s, Nat King Cole, uh, was one of the first African Americans on TV uh, he was one of the first uh, African-American stars. He was a heavy smoker. He died of lung cancer at age 45. Uh, leading man of the 60s and 70s, Steve McQueen starred uh, in such movies as The Great Escape and The Sand Pebbles. A heavy smoker all his life, McQueen died of lung cancer at age 50. One of the blonde bombshells, Betty Grable of the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, she was a famous pinup uh, for World War II soldiers. They liked her sexy legs. This is the famous pinup. A uh, smoker uh, to keep her figure. Uh, Gable died of lung cancer at age 56. Known for his raspy voice and tough guy image, Humphrey Bogart starred in films in the 40s and 50s in such films as Casablanca and the Maltese Falcon. Uh, his heavy smoking caught up with him in 1956 when he died of lung cancer at age 57. This was very common when I was, when I was uh, uh, young. 
Uh, I grew up in the 19, uh, I grew, I was born in 1949, so I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s, and I used to look at the obituaries for no reason whatsoever, but I was look, I would look at the obituaries, and it was common to see uh, people dying in their, in their late 40s and early 50s from lung cancer. Back then, they told you why people died, how they died. Um, I used to think that if I made it to 60, I was going to be lucky. Well, I'm 72 years old, but I've never smoked. And my parents, uh, both my parents lived into their 90s. My dad was 90 when he died. My mom was, uh, was 99, uh, 98, actually. She didn't quite make it to 99. Uh, and they never smoked. The point is that this stuff, uh, back then, of course, every, the, it was very common for people to smoke. Uh, so it was very common to see people dying in their 50s. Nat King Cole, Betty Grable, uh, Humphrey Bogart. Uh, known as the youngest Beatle, Harrison was, uh, George Harrison was the first to die, naturally, of course, at 58 from lung cancer. John Lennon was murdered in 1980, and he died before uh, George Harrison did. But uh, Harrison was a notorious smoker, smoked constantly, and he smoked a lot of pot. And he died at 58 of lung cancer. Benefits of quitting uh, using tobacco. 20 minutes after quitting, uh, blood pressure and pulse rate will drop and the feet and hands uh, warm to normal temperatures. Within eight hours, uh, the carbon monoxide level in the blood drops and oxygen levels increase. Uh, both will uh, increase to normal. Within 24 hours, the risk of sudden heart attack decreases. Within 48 hours, the nerve endings adjust to the absence of nicotine, while the sense of taste and smell will return. Within one week, breathing improves and constricted blood vessels begin to relax. Within 2 to 12 weeks, circulation improves, lung function increases up to 30%, and the complexion begins looking healthy again. And of course, this is the side of this is the side of the smoker, and this is the side of the non-smoker. Within one to nine uh, months, fatigue, coughing, sinus congestion, and shortness of breath uh, decrease, and lungs increase uh, their ability to handle mucus. Within one year, the risk of coronary heart disease has been cut in half. Within five years, the heart disease rate has become that of no, a non-smoker. Within 10 years, the lung cancer rate drops to just about above that of a non-smoker. Within 10 to 15 years, the disease rate has returned to that of a non-smoker. It takes you 10 to 15 years to get back to what you were before you started smoking. That is the end. One thing I want to tell you, uh, when I was working in the lab, one of the things we had to do, if somebody came in and uh, we thought they might have a carbon monoxide poisoning, we had to run a test on them. Uh, well, the test was to draw a select tube of blood, a gray top uh, tube of blood, and we would shake it, and if it foamed up, it meant that they had the carbon monoxide. But we had to run a control. We couldn't just look at it and say, yeah, that's carbon monoxide. We had to run a negative control and a positive control. So for the negative control, they used me because I was a runner. Uh, I, was an, I, I was an athlete. I was a runner. Uh, I, I didn't smoke. Uh, so I didn't have any carbon. There's no reason for me to have carbon monoxide in my system. As a positive control, we used a, a chain smoker that worked in the lab. Uh, and he smoked. I'll tell you, he smoked all the time. Uh, but we used him as a positive control. And sometimes he, he would come back more positive than uh, the person we thought that had carbon monoxide poisoning. And that's what this is. When you smoke, uh, it, uh, it, it's a vasoconstrictor. So it, sh it shuts off. <laughs> it constricts your blood vessels. So your hands are cold, your feet are cold, uh, your, your uh, face is cold. Uh, you may turn uh, cyanotic, which is purple. Um, your lips may be purple because of the carbon monoxide. You're not getting enough oxygen in your system. It's just not really bright. Okay, that's the end. I'm not going to preach anymore. Uh, I'll talk to you guys next, not next week, but the week after. We'll tackle chapter four.